Hello, and welcome to another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, author and founder of William Branham Historical Research. And with me, I have my co-host, researcher, minister, and friend, Charles Paisley, the founder of ChristianGospelChurch.org. And together, we're examining the history and the intersections in history between William Branham and other key figures that either influenced or were influenced by the post-World War II healing revivals. Charles, I'm so excited about this episode. I know this one does not have a lot to do with William Branham from the surface, but we're getting into the fun stuff for me. We're talking about the deep, dark secrets of the message that that lied underneath William Branham and his ministry. And just, what was it yesterday, you gave me a new piece of information that I did not have, I did not know, which we're going to talk about later in this episode, but my mind was blown. Yeah, John, there there's so much stuff uh, that that we're going to talk about today and you know we 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 know of course everyone knows the message official message history of of everything that happened but uh today we definitely want to lay or lay the early part of brother Branham's life uh and the start of his ministry against the backdrop of what was going on in the culture around him at that time yeah. uh help some people connect some dots and and lay some frame groundwork for uh, definitely some other stuff we're going to talk about later as well. Yeah, I'm I'm just aching to get into this. This is such exciting stuff. Yes, me too. Me too. Uh, I know I'm looking forward to it as well. We've got great stuff going on, John. Um, I've did did all kinds of refreshing myself on some of the books here in my library, and I've got a. Some interesting little uh, evidences here maybe to hold up and we can share with people as we go through. I've got even some original documents from the period wow. here. Wow, that's uh, amazing. Yeah. And you've got some exciting stuff going on just here locally, right? I do, yes, John. Uh, you know, we have, we've got the church building now, so that that's great awesome. news. We're, that's we're in the news. process of moving in, getting everything set up, and... Uh, we will be open by the time this podcast uh, goes live for you know anyone in this area who is just looking for some good Christian fellowship, some healthy Christianity, um, and you know especially people that are coming from places we know they're just looking for some some support and comfort. We're, we're definitely there to help with that, John. So I, I am really excited about that. That's awesome. That'll be a big help to a lot of people. Yeah. So so. On our agenda today, John, we're we're talking about the history of the Indiana Ku Klux Klan. Oh the boy, Indiana Ku Klux Klan, and uh, maybe we should give a little warning to people before we go into this because there's a part yeah. of this that gets pretty dark. It does, um, and so this 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 podcast might parts of this might not be uh, appropriate for young children. Right. Uh, so we definitely might want to want to turn off if you got some kiddos in the car listening right now. Exactly. And we probably should pause just a minute because I'm sure somebody who's new to my research or new to the website, etc., who are familiar with William Branham will look at this podcast and its title and think the Klan. Well, what does that have to do with William Branham? William Branham was a uh, lover of all people, we're told, right? So it's probably good to just take a minute before we get deep into it and just explain that things were not quite as they seemed. Um, I won't go into full detail because I don't want to spoil the the surprises that are coming in the future podcast, but I will say that there were two main characters who were involved in William Branham's ministry. They were They were fundamental to the creation of what is called the message. And by extension, all of these movements that were built on top of William Branham's ministry, the latter reign, the, I mean, today we call it the New Apostolic Reformation, this big umbrella of all of these things, the Kansas City prophets, I think we mentioned some of them in our last episode. All of this sits on top of this foundation of William Branham and his ministry. And yet all of these men who were involved with this have built this platform on top of what we're going to talk about today. And interestingly, from my research, I can say truly that some of these men knew this. Not all, but some of these men knew this. William Branham's uh, mentor, the literally the, the man who started his ministry, Roy E. Davis, was the official spokesperson for the 1915 Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. 
It's incredible. It's unbelievable. He was a revivalist, a con man, a grifter, a swindler. So many things I could say about him. We'll save it for another episode. But he toured and held revivals, and some of those revivals where William Branham was present included the KKK Clud. And for people who aren't aware of the hierarchy, this is the supreme religious chaplain of the Ku Klux Klan, basically the highest ranking religious leader of the Ku Klux Klan right. was, was with Roy Davis and with William Branham. And Davis's partner in, in this whole thing, in what would eventually become the third wave of the Ku Klux Klan, which we'll talk about again later, Davis's partner was Congressman William D. Upshaw, who many in William Branham's cult will be familiar with. Upshaw posed as a wheelchair invalid in one of the meetings, though he had not needed a wheelchair since the early 1900s. And William Branham raised him out of the wheelchair and he claimed healing, etc. Well, Upshaw was deeply embedded in the Klan. He was William Joseph Simmons' right-hand man, basically. And literally the reason why we have the Ku Klux Klan today because he fought and saved it in Washington. That's right, John. That's right, John. These key figures that were the key in launching William Brown's ministry were Klan-affiliated, and not just simply Klan-affiliated, but some of the highest-ranking members of the Ku Klux Klan. Right. Yeah. And, and as we'll show as time goes on, it wasn't just that they were with the Klan. One of the arguments that a lot of um, supporters of William Branham have is, quote-unquote, guilt by association, that this is just jumping to conclusions because William Branham— I mean, one of the, I've heard this frequently. Well, Jesus was with Judas, right? But there's a key difference here. Jesus did not support, promote, and lift up Judas. Jesus did not continue the ministry of Judas. Jesus was not a secret conspiracy, uh, creating a conspiracy to create a third wave of Judas, right? William Branham was deeply embedded with these men that we're talking about. You're right, John. And the, the way William Branham was around these men so much that they influenced his ministry in some key ways. And I know definitely at a certain point we want to get to talk about serpent seed, Christian identity, theology. And Brother Branham actually imported some pretty significant parts of his teaching from these men. He learned right. these from these men in the clan. Um, so they didn't simply ordain him and he was around them. They also mm -hmm. influenced his ideology, his teachings, and those teachings are carried all the way down to the present day in the message, John. And and, and uh, I, I know I've already shared with you, John, uh, I, I have some of these things. They, they'll, leaders will say this stuff maybe is, is not there anymore or we're making this up, but mm -hmm. we got them on tape, John. Exactly. We got them on tape. We have, we have recordings that uh, are not available to the public the public, which, you know, before it's over, we're going to share some of that with people um, because yeah. I mean, we're definitely certain that these yeah. things are still going on to the present day. And I'll, I'll, I'll let me uh, maybe just tap into my personal knowledge on this, John. I was the assistant pastor of the second oldest message church, continuously operating message church right. in the world. I personally received the white supremacist instructions from the leadership in that church, and we'll, we'll definitely get to that. Uh, and explain all that. So we're not yeah. uh, out on a limb at all, John. No. Right. And the last point that I'll make <clears throat> before we get into today's episode, my grandfather was the pastor at William Branham's Branham Tabernacle. And uh, I won't go too deeply right now, but I grew up in a very racist environment. I have family members who would not rent properties to black people. I have family members, high-ranking family members, who would not eat if being served by a black person in a restaurant. And these are people that everybody knew. Uh, I won't go too deeply now. We will be getting into that. But I could go on and on about these stories. And the people in this area have convinced all of the victims of the cult, of the cult personality of William Branham, that all these records were destroyed in the 1937 flood. So I've spent almost a decade, probably over a decade now, researching William Branham. 
<clears throat> and one of the uh, one of the last point I'll make the the key arguments that that is um, defending William Branham's association with these dark characters is that William Branham abandoned this, and whenever he quote unquote received his angelic visitation, he was commissioned by God to become into this faith healing ministry. And prior to that, he had no faith healing ministry. And they used the date 1946. As we'll prove in the, in the upcoming episodes, William Branham was mentored by a person who claimed to have the gift of healing. When the revival started in Jeffersonville, prior to the date that William Branham gives as his ordination, William Branham was already working with these men, with these Klan white supremacists, and they were holding a healing revival in Jeffersonville. And with that, let's get into it. We're going to talk today about the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana, because this is a background to the history for the upcoming episodes that has long since been forgotten. All right. Great. So, uh, I guess, John, maybe let me just uh, say I love Indiana history. And, you know, long Absolutely. before long before we ever got in touch with each other, I have been a, a – I will call myself a, a, an amateur Indiana historian. I have wrote hundreds, hundreds of articles, John, on Indiana history, and I'm intimately, intimately familiar with, with many aspects, even especially this, this period of time. And I will interrupt, and I will say that it's not amateur. I've read some of those articles, and – even though I didn't know it was you, I was I was gleaning facts from your research, and then we met, and I realized, oh my gosh, these articles come from Charles Baisley. <laughs> this, this, these are not amateur articles, people. This is the real thing. So, uh, and, and as you can see in my library, you, you can't see in my background, but actually off here to my side is my actually Indiana section. So what you see behind me is Branham. I have an Indiana section over here as well. Um, and so I, and I, I did pull a few of the books off the shelf here that maybe I'll show at the end. That way people can, if they want to do some reading of their own. But, uh, so maybe just as we talk about the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana a little bit, you know, uh, when we, when most people in America think of the Ku Klux Klan, they tend to think of the South, right? They think mm -hmm. of the Jim Crow. They think of, you know, what happened in the Civil War years, the Southern states trying to suppress the African Americans. And that's that started in the years after the Civil War, I think about 1867, roughly, 65, 67 in there is when the Klan started in the Southern United States. Mm -hmm. um, in the same period coming out of the Civil War here in Indiana, the exact same kind of thing happened, but they didn't call themselves the Ku Klux Klan at the time. They called themselves the White Caps, and it was mm -hmm. uh, vigilantes coming out after the uh, after the American Civil War. And I don't know if you know this, John, but the first train robbery in the United States happened in Indiana, happened here near Seymour. Oh, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, this was the actual first appearance of the White Caps in Indiana when this happened. So the, there was a gang that was terrorizing southern Indiana, the first outlaw gang in the United States, the Reno Gang. So they're terrorizing southern Indiana. They eventually get caught. They're put in jail down here at New Albany, and the White Caps appear, and they're marching in military formation. They're Civil War veterans, obviously, all wearing their white hoods. They go to the jail. They lynch these men. Uh, and then they march back wherever they came from. So this was the start of that vigilanteism wow. in America, in Indiana. And in Indiana, it was never, in those days, it was not really something racially targeted, right? It was always kind of something you might call more morally targeted or vigilanteism. And, and so that really, a lot of it is to do with the fact that there just are not very many people of racial minorities in Indiana, especially back then. Mm -hmm. And so as you come up through time, you come up to the early 1900s, we know the KKK revived in the South at that time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. William Simmons started the Klan uh, again, I think 1915 on Stone Mountain. And Roy Davis um, in one of the newspapers says that he was there. He wrote the bylaws, the Constitution. Yes. He, he was involved. So he was one of those men that created the Klan. Exactly. Roy Davis was there from the start in 1915. Okay, Then uh, shortly after they start the Klan, they send a man, his last name was Huffington, to Indiana to start a chapter of their branch of the Klan here in Indiana. He started in, in Evansville. And in Evansville, their, their chapter got pretty good size, but that, it 
more or less just stayed there in Evansville. Um, then they, at a certain point, I think about 1918 roughly, they, they decide to spread through the rest of the state. And so at that point, a man named D.C. Stevenson, really important figure here, D.C. Yes. Stevenson uh, replaces Huffington as the leader of the Klan in Indiana, reporting back to Simmons in Georgia, Simmons and Roy Davis and that crowd in Georgia. And so they go out, they, they, they tour the whole state, um, and they find just huge, huge acceptance in Indiana because vigilanteism, like I mentioned, was so widespread. And so it was kind of a natural, hey, we've already got white hoods <laughs> doing right. this and that. Let's join <laughs> right. the Klan, right? And this is a fact, probably, probably none of our listeners know this fact. The KKK in Indiana was the largest KKK organization in American history. Right. Uh, it, we Indiana was by far the largest, most developed, most powerful branch of the KKK ever. Physically um, and politically, they almost took over Washington. It, exactly. They they completely took over the state of Indiana. Um, by the time uh, Stevenson, I here's just one book I'll, I'll reference. It's the Klan in Indiana. Uh, it, it's a pretty good book. That's it's a good by book. Leonard Moore. And as as time goes on, they they quickly get. Uh, about one third of the white population in Indiana joins the Klan in those years, right? So we're talking, yeah. you know, in excess of a million people have joined the Klan in those years. It, it's really just a phenomenal, incredible growth. And they had outreach. They were so the the Klan split into factions. And I've read articles where they were they were recruiting for the Indiana sect of the Klan, even in other states and right. in other countries. I've I've found one article. I think as far as Canada, they had an outreach for recruiting members into this philosophy or this sect of the Klan. Yeah. And one point I want to bring up for listeners who are overseas who aren't as familiar. You hear the name Klan, and everybody seems to know that these are these men in white hoods, and they they have the misconception that they were only anti-black. But this was a domestic terrorist organization. This was not in any way, shape, or form a good thing. If you were to compare it in today's world, it would be to Christianity as Al-Qaeda is to Islam. This was an extremist, a militant extremist version of Christianity from its inception. Yeah, that, that's spot on, John. Uh, they used uh, violence. They used intimidation, threats, you know, all means uh, to achieve and implement their agenda. And like you mentioned, John, as they as they they were so ubiquitous, they were so common in Indiana. This probably again things probably nobody knows. So in in Kokomo, Indiana, for example, they had a Klan rally. Kokomo, Indiana, one hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Uh, I saw that. 100,000 uh, masked Klansmen marched in the rally at Kokomo. It was the, the largest uh, Klan rally, you know, I believe ever, John. It was even yeah. bigger than the ones that they held in D.C. back back in that period. Um, 100,000. The the state government was entirely elected by the Klan, entirely controlled by the Klan. The governor, mm -hmm. the general assembly, everything. And... The the state fair in those days had a Klan day, John, and they would have a yep. you'd have a nighttime cross burning at the uh, state fair, right? So I mean, it, I'm hopefully setting the tone. This was just everyday right. life in Indiana during the 1920s. They had a women's branch of the Klan. They had a children's branch of the Klan, and it it would be like you know, kind of like the Boy Scouts, but it was Klan instead. And they had movies that there were Klan movie producers that were producing propaganda movies for white supremacy that churches in Indiana were playing in their churches. Right, and in in. So my family has lived in Indiana for generations, John, and my great grandparents were in the Klan back then. I mean, uh, and of course you know the rest about me, right? So the <laughs> the uh, there's the our families were in the Klan back then. It was a widespread thing in the state. It was huge. It was huge. Yeah. Um, and so one one thing that people often maybe a little slight misnomer about the Klan in Indiana. So. When when we think of the Klan nowadays, we almost think of them always strictly in in their racial views, right? Yeah. The number one enemy of the Klan is racial minorities, right? And, and, and usually the misconception it's just black people. It, exactly. Um, 
and when we look at that historically, certainly in the South, in the South, uh, racial minorities have been enemy number one. Uh, but in the North, in the states like Indiana, enemy number one of the Klan was not racial minorities. And I think this is perhaps a fact that when I say this is going to connect some dots for some people who are very familiar with William Branham's ministry. Right. Enemy number one of the Klan in Indiana was the Catholic Church. Yep. Enemy number one was Catholics, and that was who was the primary target of the Klan in those years. Not to say they yeah. weren't also targeting enemy number two and three. Right, racial right. Well, there weren't that many black people in Indiana, right? There wasn't exactly. a chance for them to be so much anti-black. Interestingly, I've done deep studies on this, and some of it is in my research and in my books, but <clears throat> this misconception that it's just anti-black mostly comes from the third wave of the Klan whenever right. they're lynching black people. That's that's the that's the cons that's the um, image that people get formed in their mind, but there were a lot of key factors. The idea was that from its inception, there was this notion by white supremacists in Georgia and well Georgia through Texas. I mean, this was big in the South that um, Protestant white Christianity was being invaded by Catholicism by the sudden influx of Jews. Um, there, there was this, there's a, a complicated um, route springing in multiple different directions. One of the biggest factors right before the 1915 Klan was rebirthed was a, um, there was a Jew by the name of Leo Frank who got falsely convicted of murder in one of his factories. Uh, he was a, he was a businessman. And um, so the Klan was not just anti-black. They were targeting basically anybody who didn't fit the white Protestant mold in America, and they called it, quote, true Americanism, and which right. is a point that we'll keep bringing up throughout the series. Right. You're, you're spot on, John. I'll, I'll just read a sentence or two here out of this book uh, on, the, on the Indiana Klan. It says, uh, American Catholics were the most frequent targets of the Indiana Klan's propaganda and activities, right? So that right. that's who their number one target was. And they were their, – their main goal through government was passing uh, laws as a number of anti-Catholic laws were proposed by the Klan-dominated legislature in Indiana. Uh, for the most part, they were targeting shutting down Catholic parochial schools, trying to hinder the expansion of their churches – um, anything they could to run Catholics out of the state. That was yeah. that was agenda item number one for the Klan in Indiana. And, you know, of course, we're not here defending the Catholic Church, John. <laughs> Certainly, right. you know, they, they've got their fair share of problems, right? Um, but when you know William Branham and you know uh, his uh, background, his, his ideology, the things he preached, um, realizing he was part of a militant anti-Catholic organization mm -hmm. uh, is, is something that is perhaps... Uh, more co is comprehensible to people. Yeah. I, I hope so. And there was a war. You can find this on uh, on the on my website. You can find some research articles. But the Klan published a uh, newspaper outside of um, Indianapolis, and they mentioned a war on the Catholic priests in Jeffersonville. So right at home, this war is raging between the Catholics and the Klan. And William Branham himself even mentions which side he took in this war, which we'll, again, talk about later. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of what set this off is Indiana obviously had been a, had very low, and I could find the page in there, the, the, it was almost no racial minorities in the state historically, almost no Catholics in the state historically. Right. But, but from 1910 to 1920, the Catholic population jumped to about 20% of the state. And that's part of what uh, was was driving this reaction of the Klan was this large influx of Catholic immigrants um, from Europe um, that that was feeding into some of these tensions that the Klan was trying to battle battle against. Right. So, right. right. And there were some strange minorities, right? Um, so at the same time that all of this is being formed, you had the Azusa Street revival. So you had. Uh, this influx of Pentecostalism, which yes. initially was accepted because it was just simply there were a lot of white people in these revivals and whatnot. But there's one key figure that's of interest, and his name is G.T. Haywood, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Yes, John. Yes. And so the 
he was a, a an important oneness Pentecostal leader here in Indiana and even nationally. Uh, you know, by mm-hmm. the time his ministry was over, and, internationally, yes. And and what what Azusa Street did, Azusa Street and the, and the and the revival that spread from that, it broke the rules, John. Uh, it yeah. start. It was there was racial mingling going on there. Yeah. And that was white, white supremacists did not like that. Yes, hated that, right? And so, so you have you have in Indiana uh, and and the United States, you have an element of of white society who is egalitarian. They're happy to enter. You know, they have no problem at all. You know, getting along with their non-white neighbors, right? But you, then you have this other segment that these people join in the Klan, who hate the fact that their other white neighbors are getting along right. <laughs> and going to the same church as uh, the Africans and so forth. And culturally, there's this weird thing in the state of Indiana because, again, as Charles has pointed out, this was an Indiana version of the Klan. They were more anti-Catholic than they were anti-black because there weren't that many black people. They were also, if you think about the sheer number of people in the Klan in Indiana— you had people who didn't know they were supposed to be anti-black who were in this thing. So they were they were actually white supremacists in these organizations who were attending G.T. Haywood's revivals, which is crazy interesting. Yes, and, and Hayward, I, I think we said that he was African-American, um, and, and he was uh, one of the early oneness apostolic leaders, uh, yeah. you know, in the mold of—, um, of uh, uh, oh, forget his name, the leader uh, of the revival in Azusa Street. Um, so you had Parham, and then you also had... <laughs> I keep wanting to say William, William Joseph Simmons, but that's... Will, William the, Seymour the other, is his name. William Seymour is his Seymour, name, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so Hayward was in Seymour's uh, mold uh, and here in Indiana. And so, yeah, he was very uh, key in spreading the Jesus name baptism yep. formula he it was very key in spreading uh the uh non-trinitarian view of the godhead that is very popular in message circles still um and to people who grew up in the message and under the propaganda and indoctrination who were trained falsely to believe that william Branham brought oneness or jesus baptism as the original truth it wasn't Branham who did this. G.T. Haywood largely popularized it, and his it was popular worldwide because of Haywood long before William Branham even claimed to have been visited by an angel. Right, right. This stuff was going on well before William Branham was was here, and yeah, uh, and before William Branham had had grown up, all this stuff already in in a lot of ways existed. Right. Um, you know, just like his Godhead views. There's almost nothing that William Branham preached that was actually original. Uh, I know. That, I've got a library that, here behind me to prove it. <laughs> that that was one of the funny things that struck me, and it took me years after being after escaping this thing, after being under the, the influence and mind control, to realize that we were taught he had these original truths, and not a single one of them was not original. One. Not one. Not one. Not a single one of them. Not a single one of them, John. It's hard and, to believe, man. I know. I mean, I still, you've been out a lot longer than me. For me, it's still a knife in the heart, right? right? You know, how in the world could he did that to us? But he did. All right. He did. Yeah. So as, as we keep going on, maybe we'll we'll come back here to the clan just a little bit more. And so as G.T. Hayward was, was doing his stuff, uh, he called... He what was he had a publication? What was it, John? Called the Victim of the Flaming Sword. Do you remember that? Victim of the Flaming Sword. I, I actually did not know this until just I think it was end of last year. I'm working with another Pentecostal historian, and he has explained to me the deep roots of racism in the Pentecostal movement, even though he is supportive of the Pentecostal movement. But he found my research and we started collaborating. And yeah, it's it's really a big deal what's going on behind the scenes of all of these men yeah it, it's crazy and there there seems to be this attempt at this point in pentecostalism in indiana this uh, attempt to segregate black and white pentecostalism right there, there's there, there's a there's a little bit of kickback against the racial mixing um jt heward's involved in it mm-hmm. and you know we know davis in the 20s starts a group with Simmons called the Knights of the Flaming Sword. 
Right. Uh, and and again, you wonder, is this related to Hayward's victim of the flaming sword? Right. Because the names are so right. similar uh, in, in the things. These things happen at the same time. Yeah, that's that's basically where um, where this led when I started. Uh, I had actually not heard of G.T. Haywood until I started working with this historian, and he started explaining to me that he is the reason why oneness Pentecostalism existed. And when I started looking through, I saw the victim of the flaming sword and already knew about the Knights of the Flaming Sword. This was an even worse terroristic organization that they actually disbanded themselves because they became so militant. People were dying. People, they were shooting each other, basically. Wow. And that was and going on here in Indiana. That was going on, uh, start, actually started in Chattanooga. But if you look at what happened, if you look at the timeline and piece it together, G.T. Haywood published Victim of the Flaming Sword. It became widely popular. His interracial desegregated revivals were quickly spreading. He was creating a movement in the United States. White supremacists can't have this. So they, especially in the South. So they rose up, created Vic, the Knights of the Flaming Sword, which appears to be a response to it. And then if you look at what happened historically, Davis starts moving his way towards Indiana. Mm, so right. there's, there appears to be a significant connection. Right. I, I think you're spot on, John. There, there's definitely some reaction going on among the Klansmen to what G.T. Howard, uh, G.T. Hayward was doing in that right. period of time, John. And so, so as, as these things are swirling, right, in the 1920s, while William Branham is growing up in Indiana, a uh, teenager, he's in his teenage years at that point, um, uh, you know, s something happens in the Klan in here in Indiana. So Indiana, biggest Klan organization, the leader of the Klan in Indiana, this is is probably the most powerful Klan figure in the United States, mm -hmm. perhaps other than the Imperial Wizard himself. Um, there was a man named D.C. Stevenson. We already talked about him. Came out of Evansville, became Grand Dragon of the state, and. What what happens is in the year 1925, he gets into trouble here in Indiana with the law. And I, I've got a, a, the, one of the maybe the first pictures that I will share here, John. Just a newspaper clipping and a picture of D.C. Stevenson and a woman named Madge Overberg. Yeah. And what happened was D.C. Stevenson, um, he raped murdered and the way the newspapers described it is it appeared she had been chewed on like a cannibal had chewed on her right and stevenson had had chewed on this woman like a cannibal and then he he killed her after after he had you know raped her and he she wasn't the only sexual victim from what no. i read in the newspapers no she she was the point at which at which he got caught okay so so the Klan in Indiana uh, is led by a uh, rapist, murderous cannibal, right? Okay, <laughs> boy, that's pretty, uh, pretty dark, isn't it, John? Pretty bad. And and this is this is national news when this breaks, John. This is you know this is it's front page news, mm -hmm. coast to coast. The leader of the Klan in Indiana is arrested. He has raped, murdered, and chewed on a woman until she died. And this, I mean, that's, that's awful. And, and so this is happening also right here in Indiana while William Branham is a teenager. And um, this actually is so scandalous, so awful, that this actually starts the national decline of the Klan, right? Yeah. So the Klan and the exposure. It. He exactly. started naming names because he was going to prison. Exactly, exactly. So once, once, once this happened... The Klan membership in Indiana collapsed. Uh, right. You know, 99% of the Klan members exited the Klan as soon as that happened. Uh, you know, it just dropped away to a drop in the bucket from what it used to be. And once he was in Klan, he started calling in favors. Uh, Governor uh, Edwards, I got you elected. I want you to pardon mm -hmm. me. Right. So he starts calling in these favors and and they won't honor him. They won't pardon him. Right. And so then from prison... He starts threatening, I'm going to start outing all the Klan members, all the Klan leaders, and start selling all the Klan secrets to the newspapers from prison, right? And that's right. what he starts to do in jail uh, once he's arrested. 
Um, and and as and as he does that, that takes a terrible toll on the clan here in Indiana and nationally. Uh, and the clan goes into steep decline uh, as you come into the year 1927. That, that's when he started selling his secrets and tell, ratting everyone out. It was in 27. So 1925, he's arrested. 1927, he goes to prison and starts ratting everybody out. And to further paint the picture of the scandal, it's not just that the leader was corrupt and the leader fell. When he started naming names, it became obvious and apparent that they were bullying by force and violence people into positions and it wasn't just that they planted clan people into political offices they planted non-clan people into political offices but either blackmailed them or had information or bullied them or threatened their families when this thing was fully exposed at the time that william branham was being molded into what he would later become this was the most villainous scandalous terroristic organization in the united states that's by right. by far the most that's right and, and if somebody wants to get a book and, and read the kind of the specific things of mm -hmm. dc Stevens, here's a great book grand dragon it's on the life of dc stevenson chronicles his misadventures and his ultimate um being caught for just these horrendous, horrendous things that he was doing while leader of the Klan. And, and back, to the, back to the guilt by association claim. If you look at this exact scenario and William Branham being in this environment, it would be the similar, not even close actually, it would be you've got the choice of choosing Jesus or Judas. Well, instead of choosing Judas, he chose far, far worse than Judas could have been. I mean, we're talking about the most vile form of evil in the United States at that time. It, exactly, John. You're spot on. And and here's where we, we will maybe kind of pause talking about the Klan and start asking the questions, what was William Branham doing while all this stuff was going on? Where was he according to his life story testimony quotes he made and where does he fit into this picture and the first thing we know so 1925 is the year that stevenson does these terrible things and gets arrested so that's that's about a year and a half after they've paid william branham's hospital bill right yeah. so in 1923 they've paid william branham's hospital bill and remember several years later branham says quote um I'll I can never, never forget, forget them. them. See, mm -hmm. no matter what they do or what, there's still something that stays with me. You know, he, they still have a special place in his heart. They have a special place in my heart. Okay, so, these people who kill anybody who's against them, who are doing just completely unethical and illegal things, they have a special place in his heart. Right, special place in his heart, and and this and this happened, you know, within a year and a half national news right here in indiana right where william branham was their leader raped cannibalized murdered a woman right and william branham says no matter what they do you know i'm mm -hmm. i'm still going to like them and stick with them and so right. and so something happens there 1925 1927 okay everybody 99 percent of the people drop out of the clan in indiana as you come through that period of time but william branham stayed connected to the yeah. clan through the, so maybe we could say he maybe didn't realize what he was in up to that point right like i'm sure we could make that argument well, one of the critical facts that i did not have and you recently I, I think within the last three weeks gave me this one is that dc stevens see the clan um the clan split in the early 1920s after there was a there's a lot of people who were getting lynched a lot of black people getting killed and they the clan had taken over governments it wasn't just indiana and whenever they became exposed there was a new york world article that exposed the clan as being a domestic terrorist organization there was a congressional inquiry into the clan and william joseph simmons the founder and william D. Upshaw, Congressman William D. Upshaw, who's in, affiliated with Branham's ministry, went to defend the Klan. Simmons is ousted, and the Klan split, and there was a division. Right. And you basically had, at this point, two different sects of the Klan, which later became many more. Exactly. But one of the facts that you gave me is that D.C. Stevenson 
and Roy E. Davis, William Branham's mentor, were on the same, same side of side. that split. Exactly. You're spot on, John. When the Klan split, the Indiana Klan and its leadership went with the Roy Davis, William Simmons faction, right? Yes. Yep. And um, Hiram, Hiram Evans, <coughs> who led the alternate faction, he actually uh, ousted Stevenson. He attempted to oust right. Stevenson as leader in here in Indiana. <clears throat> and that's what triggered his separation and, and, and realignment mm -hmm. back with Joseph Simmons and Roy Davis. Yeah. Right. So, so they're in the same faction of the Klan as William Branham. Yeah. Very, very incredible. And so again, just, just for our, just to remind our, our listeners. So the, the 1923, the Klan pays William Branham's hospital bills. Um, 1925, Stevenson is arrested for rape, murder, and cannibalizing a woman. And, then two years after that, 1927, is when Stevenson starts outing people to the news from jail. 1927 is the year that William Branham disappears <laughs> as well, right? Okay. <laughs> yes. So what a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. So 1927 is the year that William Branham goes to, in his life story, he went to Arizona for, for some time. How long he was there, did he even go, is, is still kind of an open question. You know, we have maybe some evidence to suggest perhaps he went. We have other evidence to suggest perhaps he didn't. It, it's not conclusive at this point. But right. whatever the case, William Branham disappears uh, at the same time that D.C. Stevenson is burning the Klan organization <laughs> down to the ground out of revenge for him not being pardoned uh, for yeah. for his crimes. Okay, so this and it. It also formed this void, if you will. There, there was a time in which Indiana Klan was the largest Klan organization in the nation. And then D.C. Stevenson fell, the Klan imploded. And then there's this void which creates an opportunity for somebody to come in and take over. Exactly. And who better to take over than someone from Stevenson's faction who can come in and use the same network that Stevenson built, right? Absolutely. Yep. And so 1927, Stevenson's in jail outing people. The Klan's falling apart. Uh, two years later, 1929, who arrives in town, John? <laughs> Roy E. Davis. Roy and E. Davis. And his brothers. And his brothers start coming to town. It's unbelievable. Yeah. They, they show up from uh, a Klan Central down south. They come up here to Indiana uh, and... We'll get more into what all he was doing, but at the time he was trying to found a new, he had started founding a new white supremacist organization in Tennessee, right? And he's also simultaneously with the Imperial Clud, the national chaplain of the Klan, is also starting a new religious denomination, right, John? Yes. And yes. he's opening up branches of these denominational churches as he comes up through this area, and he lands in Jeffersonville, and they open a new church here um, in 1929. Yes. Uh, and it, should, it should be pointed out, as you've found recently, and I was very excited to learn, <clears throat> he was ousted, Roy Davis was ousted from the Baptist Church. He was in a missionary branch of the Baptist Church, and the missionary board ousted him in, what was it, August of 1926, I think, right? That's right. Um, and when he came, he actually didn't land in Jeffersonville first. He landed in Louisville first. And you can find on my website, on the Roy Davis page, there are... Um, there are newspaper articles where there are ministers who are explicitly telling, the, warning the public that this person who's in the, quote, Pentecostal Baptist Church of God is not a Baptist, even though it has Baptist in the name. He is <laughs> not a Baptist. So, so for, our, for, for our listeners, John, I, I just want to share just a few very introductory things about Roy Davis. Um, I have here a, a, this is an original Voice of Healing magazine, John, uh, from 1950. And yeah. uh, this is, so these are very rare. These are very hard yeah. to find, John. <laughs> That's gold and, right there. <laughs> yes. And, and I have on my shelf a complete collection, John. Um, so, and, and if, it, if you would like to know where these are, this came from a family that used to attend the Branham Tabernacle. And when they, wow. the, 
the lady who owned this collection passed away. Uh, her family gave the collection to me. Uh, and so these people were at the tabernacle, you know, John. So I, this, this is yeah. straight, straight from where these are from. Anyways, in, in this uh, 1950 edition, there is, and you can put a better picture for the people, this article talking yep. about William Branham's first pastor, Roy Davis, the man we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And we got his photograph here. I'm so glad, John. I'm so glad they put his photograph in here. I know, because I linked it all together. Thank if you, not for that, <laughs> Thank not you, Thank you, William that, Branham. Right. If not for that, we could not have tied him to the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux yes. Klan. So here he is, okay? And now mm-hmm. here is the same man in yes. a newspaper article where he is being interviewed as the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, John. And, 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 one, can... and one thing I want to point out with that article, it, the title is, The Klan is Very Small in, in Texas. Texas. I, I have to give some background because it was not very small in Texas. No, it was They're wasn't. quoting what he's saying, and they have just gone through. So it was a, a big cross burning, I think, is what started this whole thing. There was a, there was a government inquiry into his sect, and he was trying to say, no, we're not very large. We're this little tiny group. Exactly. They were, they were very, very large in yeah. Texas. And, and here is another picture of also Roy Davis. Here he is in full Klan uniform as Imperial Wizard in Shreveport, yes. Louisiana, which is where William Branham held many of his revivals at, which is also, to, John— To yeah, my point, the sect went from all through Texas all the way into Louisiana, Alabama, and even into Florida. Right, and no, Shreveport, which is also the same place Voice of Healing is published from. Right, yep. John. There's so much stuff. <laughs> We're going to get into so much stuff, John, before this is over with. <laughs> what um, a coincidence! Yeah, no coincidence at all, right? But we'll we'll get into that more at another later time. So, at any rate, our our readers should be able to see very clearly. William Branham was this man, Roy Davis, was the Imperial Wizard of the Klan by the by the fifties, and and this is the same man we can go back and find out was claiming to be second in command of the of the National KKK in the twenties. And here I've got one other thing I want to read, John, just before uh, we maybe step on just a little more. This is he questions and answers on Hebrews from October 6, 1957. And just one little quote. William Branham is talking about his very first church here, and he says, Now it's been said, and I hope my colored friends that's here will excuse this remark. The first time I met anyone in my life after I had been converted, I met Brother George D. Ark and them down there. George D. Ark was Roy Davis's assistant pastor at the Jeffersonville Church. And he said, yes. as, as I walk, the Lord led me to a little place and they was discussing where the colored man came from. And they were saying the colored man uh, was came from Cain, who married an animal like an ape. So without going into too much more, racism, racial, very racial things were being taught in Roy Davis's church by William Branham's own admission. Yeah. Um, there is no ch- – we know exactly w- what these things were, John, that were going on. And – Go ahead. I'll add another thing after you do. Yeah. So we're going to get into the serpent seed doctrine much later, but I want to point out that quote surprised me because we were taught he brought these original truths. And if, if a prophet from God, which he claimed to be, brought an original truth, that truth would be unwavering because even as William Branham says, God does not change his mind. Right. In that quote, he says he basically disagrees with the serpent seed doctrine. Right. And it wasn't until the Little Rock Nine incident or event in civil rights history, you can look up Little Rock Nine on the web and find everything about it. This was a significant civil rights incident anti-integration protest by the state of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the climax of that event that William Branham introduced his Christian identity doctrine, Serpent Seed, which we'll get into in a later episode. Exactly, exactly. And certainly up until his mid to late ministry, he was still publicly saying he did not believe these things, but he did leave these nuggets here to let us know this he had heard, and these things were happening all the way back to when he was with Roy Davis in the 1920s. And yeah. so, um, and, and I'll add this on, John. I, I, I think I mentioned to you this before this call. I, you know, I personally have known people who were in Roy Davis's church with William Branham. Okay, that's significant. Yes, John. And 
we're we'll get more into all these things but we know what we're talking about right like we're not yeah. i'm not out on a limb here right because I, I i i turned my life upside down <laughs> over this stuff so obviously i didn't do it on a whim i'm just waiting for those interview details to be published yeah. and i'm sure our yeah. listeners are too the things that you have are amazing yeah and so uh as we kind of come back to william branham in the 1920s you know there's the question is when did william branham start working with roy davis you know what year and i just want to kind of work backwards from when we're 100 percent sure back to when <clears throat> it's possible and so yeah. we are 100 percent sure william branham was working with roy davis from 1929 he was definitely working with him we you know we have newspaper articles putting them together we've got lots of records we're 100 percent sure they were together in 1929 and it should be pointed out that was in Nashville, Tennessee. William right. Branham. That shocked me. I learned that a few years ago because on one of our family vacations, we a friend of mine told me to go visit the Nashville Parthenon. I knew nothing about this connection and would never have known had I not visited. But I walk in here and, oh, my gosh, this is the place that he's talking about. He, he says he can't remember where it's at, but he's out there outside of the Parthenon. He describes literally the Parthenon, which I'm standing in front of, you know, and I go back and look at the dates and oh my gosh, Roy Davis's revival at that Parthenon was in 1929 in Nashville. Yes. And let me actually back up. It, uh, it, 1928 was that one, John, uh, I believe. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So you're one, right. 1928. One year further back. Sorry. Yeah. So we, we also think it's incredibly likely, just like you said, John, that they were even together before that. They were together in 1928. Yeah. Because in another William, state. Yes. Because William Branham, he's out of town in those years, right? And he's describing those revival events. And like you said, we've been able to compare what he says. And we have a pretty good uh, understanding of Roy Davis's um revival schedule from those years yeah. right and william branham does seem to be talking that he was at his meetings in 1928 helping him as well mm -hmm. and then there's also a possibility that he was with william with roy davis as early as 1926 and 1927 and we we arrive at that by william branham claimed to be ordained as a missionary baptist right right and so Roy Davis was um, excommunicated and expelled from the Baptists in 1926. Yeah. So if if William Br if Roy Davis really was a missionary Baptist when he ordained William Branham, that would have to put him together uh, at least from 1926. Yeah. So. So, so from there, we have 1926, 1927, 1928, 1929 that that. William Branham, in those years, somewhere in there, William Branham has started definitely working with Davis. Mm -hmm. The exact circumstances of how it came about, you know, we're not 100% sure. But somewhere yeah. in there, by the end of it, William Branham is touring on campaign or revivals with the future Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, the former second-in-command mm -hmm. of the Ku Klux Klan. While he's building his sect. Exactly, why he's founding his new denomination, being sponsored by the Imperial Clud, the Imperial Chaplain, the National Chaplain yeah. of the Klan. Yeah. And again, the Klan was a religious institution. It was. It was, it was built on the premise of religion. And the, the fact that they're together, you know, <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to get much deeper into this as we go, but there are a lot of our listeners who are just fascinated who actually are not interested in religion at all, but they're more interested in this clan connection, all the conspiracy behind where we're headed with this. And a lot of these people, like myself, are interested in watching these documentaries on criminal minds and how they work. And these listeners know, uh, some of our, our former message or current message listeners may not know this, but pathological liars are almost all the same. They're the way in which you identify the truth behind a pathological liar statements is you try to find the thread of truth that they wrap all of the lies around. The only way that they can keep their stories straight is to put hints of truth. And these are like your beacons in this sea of darkness, right? And as we're, as we're going to prove as time goes on in this podcast episode, William Branham was a pathological liar. 
the things that he said are not true. We're, we have, so at this point, we have thousands of points of evidence of this. But one of the elements that he gives that stays consistent, the way in which you study a pathological liar, see what is consistent over time, that's your truth marker, and then take all the things that change, that's your fiction, and then you try to find, okay, why is he doing the fiction? The marker in this case is, he says, Missionary Baptist Church, and he often gives the year 1933 as the beginning of his ministry, but as we'll show as time goes on, Roy Davis was out of the Baptist Church in 1926, and when he came to Jeffersonville, it was a new sect. It was not the Missionary Baptist Church. But William Branham consistently said Baptist, and in one point he even says it's a part of the Southern Baptist Convention, which fully identifies what Davis was prior to 1926. So this means that the dates that he's giving is wrong, the the fiction, we, we now understand what is the fiction, so now we want to know is what is the truth. Why is he working with Davis during those years? But more, more to the point for the conspiracy theorists, the interesting thing is why do you lie to cover up your past? And that's where we're going to get into some fascinating stuff. Right, right, John. And that, that really is the thing. You know, as, we, as, our, as our listeners uh, start maybe to have it sink in that William Branham was doing some stuff that was not all on the up and up, during these years he was involved pretty closely with some very shady characters it starts to make sense to them why he started to reinvent his life story uh in later years right because some of these figures are going to end up in jail at a certain point yes and uh and and so william brown's gonna have to do something uh to uh to to change and rewrite some of these stories so you know when i walk away from this episode john and just these things we've talked about there's a lot of facts, but like you said, there's a whole lot of questions, right? And one question I have, I go back to, this was a huge question for me when I first saw that William Branham was in the clan, John. Um, when I first, you know, realized his clan connection, right? I shouldn't say in the clan, but his clan connection, right? Right. And how could he, you know, in 1923... Because, I, again, I love Indiana history, and when I heard these things, it just, this this don't make sense to me. How could he, in 1923, the Klan pays his bill, you know, a, a year and a half later, the Imperial Wizard, or the Imperial, the Grand Dragon, uh, rapes, cannibalizes, murders a woman, and then William Branham say, nothing they ever do could, you know, ever make me stop loving them. What in the world? Like, so I, I, I... Because that happened at in the exact same time period yes. that he's that this hospital bill thing happened that he can never forget. So apparently, apparently he don't have a problem with a with with, with this stuff happening because he says nothing he they, they do is going to stop him from uh, having a special place in his heart. My. Well, I so I have I have that question and that question plagued me. I continued digging. I don't have the full answer because we'll never know. Yeah. We'll never have that no, answer. No, we won't. Never know. But I do have some additional puzzle pieces that sort of paint the picture that the answer could be. The clan is moving in. They're invading Jeffersonville. You've got. Charles Branham, William Branham's father, who's producing liquor for the Wathen Liquor Ring that is supplying the Chicago mob. It's not just Chicago mob. They're supplying Cincinnati mob other places, too. You've got the Catholic priests who are moving into Jeffersonville. So the white supremacists are wanting to clean up Jeffersonville. Also at the same time, Jeffersonville is widely known throughout the state of Indiana and the state of Kentucky for its quote-unquote quick marriages, for people who come to Jeffersonville to have sex, but because their convictions wouldn't allow them to do it unmarried, they would quickly get married, have sex, and then go get divorced in Kentucky. This was a real problem in Jeffersonville. Clan comes in, moves in, cleans up the liquor ring, starts fighting the Catholics. William Branham gets shot in the middle of this. Now, he clearly does not like his father. His father's using him for slave labor to produce the whiskey, and he gets shot. The statements he made are one question, but then 
shortly after getting shot, he buys a brand new vehicle and starts touring the country. Where this family, if you read the newspaper articles, they were so destitute, they had to have the clan pay the hospital bill. They didn't have food to put on the table. They became a, a charity case in Jeffersonville. Where does this kid get the money to buy a new car and start touring the country? Right. There, there is definitely something going on here in these years that William Branham is hiding he's covering up and he's rewrote his life story to hide and we have yeah. hints we have bits we've got clues that start to point to certain things we're, we, we're not somewhere we can draw a conclusion for sure but we can say john with total certainty what william branham told us was happening in these years he was absolutely misleading us totally misleading us and so um you know, as as we maybe bring this uh, episode down to a uh, to an end or close to an end, John, I'm I'm excited for the next episodes. Absolutely, and our listeners too. I mean, I can picture everybody right now. Everybody's hearing this; they're going to be putting on their detective caps because this sets the stage for where we're headed with this, and we're going to be giving you enough clues that this mystery can be solved. You can figure out what's going on behind the scenes, and. You know, William Branham said some things that were true and good. I'm not I'm not going to lie about that. He said sometimes you have to read between the lines. Well, look what's going on here and read between the lines. Yeah, exactly, John. Exactly. That's that's a very good use of uh, William Branham's message right there. <laughs> The other thing he got right was you are supposed to baptize your pancakes. I'm not going to lie. That is the way that you eat a pancake. <laughs> baptize pancake. <laughs> We've got so much exciting stuff to talk about in the next episodes, John. I I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, let me uh, share these books again real quick. D.C. Stevenson, The Grand Dragon by M. Lulhots. and Great book. Citizen Klansman by Leonard Moore. Must uh, read. The Clan by Patsy Sims. Yep. And super interesting, this woman was also, believe it or not, a investigator into the healing revivals. Can somebody shout Amen by Patsy Sims? I was just going to ask if you got that book because that was the biggest surprise for me. Um, I think, and I'm paraphrasing, but she said she attended the revival meetings of William Branham and noticed that there'd be a Klan rally in a city, and then suddenly there's this revival with William Branham, and the same people just seem to be in the place. Right. She She's at both. She don't fully make the connection, but she notes in her book she was surprised to see the same groups of people at both mm -hmm. events. Um yeah, read what between a, the lines. Read between the lines, right? <laughs> what What's going on here? What's going Absolutely. on Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, there we go. It's exciting stuff. We're, I'm getting anxious because the next episode gets even better. If you've enjoyed the show and you want more information, check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org and christiangospelchurch.org. For an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the healing revivals, read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message. It's available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. And we have an exciting episode next week. Join us again for more. 